Dutch Schultz, Tsar of Crime. Late one murky night in October 1935, two hard-faced young gangsters stood over a man tied to a bed in a dingy New York hotel. Armed with two tiny Boy Scout axes, they were carrying out the orders of their boss, Dutch Schultz, the city's public enemy number one, in hacking to death his latest and most dangerous rival, pretty Louis Amberg. When their victim eventually succumbed to the torture, they wrapped his blood-drenched body in blankets and took it out to dump in a Brooklyn street. Pleased with their efficiency, Dutch Schultz gave them a bonus and sat back relieved that another threat to his life had been removed. What he did not know, however, was that pretty Louis had already planned his, Schultz's, liquidation. Just before the Dutchman's henchmen kidnapped him, he had visited a gang of professional killers in New Jersey and paid them $50,000 to do a clean, quick job on Schultz. Being strictly ethical assassins, the New Jersey boys did not see that Amberg's death relieved them of their obligation. Accordingly, eleven days later, they cornered Schultz and three of his followers in a Bronx restaurant. They riddled the place with machine gun fire as the Dutchman's bodyguards whipped out their automatics to defend him. Schultz dived for the door of a washroom. For a second it seemed as if his famous luck would hold and he would make it. Then, with his fingers on the handle, he slipped to the floor. One bullet of the dozens caught him in the left side. He died in hospital a few hours later. Ironically, it was discovered when the slug was removed that it was a forty-five. All the attackers had been firing thirty-eights from submachine guns. Therefore, the bullet that removed the scourge of New York must have been an accidental stray shot from one of his own men before they had been mown down. Schultz was a master criminal. He made a success of every nefarious enterprise he set his mind to. Somehow he had a sixth sense, which warned him when a particular racket had been worked out or was becoming dangerous and it was time to get into something else. Thus he deserted bootlegging for drug running and slot machines. When they proved unsatisfactory, he took over the lucrative numbers racket. At the time of his death, he was preparing to invade the loan shark money lending racket. He was born in the Bronx in New York in 1902 as Arthur Fliegenheimer, the son of respectable Dutch Jewish parents. The spell in reform school for petty theft when he was 16 was the only brush with the police until 1926, when he emerged as the up-and-coming young man of the mushrooming liquor racket. Already known as the Dutchman, he decided to change his name to Schultz. His associates naturally tacked on the Dutch as his Christian name. He was Dutch Schultz for the rest of his life. Schultz entered bootlegging as bodyguard to Harry Drucker, one of the early beer kings of the Bronx. A born Machiavellian schemer, he soon talked Drucker's two lieutenants, Bo Weinberg and little Augie Ogden, into joining him in a rebellion. In October 1927, the three of them took their boss for a ride from which he did not return. For a few months, the three traitors carried on the dead man's business in partnership. Then Weinberg and Ogden went the same way as Drucker. Whether Schultz or some enemy mobster was responsible was never determined. Now in control of the liquor racket in the Bronx, Dutch Schultz plunged into a series of bitter feuds with rival bootleggers in the boroughs, Waxy Gordon... Legs Diamond, Chink Sherman, and Vincent Mad Dog McCall, for control of the city itself. By the end of 1930, Gordon and Diamond had been killed. Schultz, with his capacity for business organization on a giant scale, had pushed his annual sales up to the $2 million mark. He had 17 breweries scattered across New York and neighboring New Jersey. After paying the police protection and the salaries of his 100 strong-arm men, it was estimated he was pocketing $500,000 a year. Gradually, as Schultz's power grew, the opposition bootleggers were put out of business. If they resisted, they were put on the spot. But in Brooklyn, Chink Sherman, although most of his trade had been cut from under him, refused to give up the fight. Then Dutch added insult to injury by stealing Chink's girl a beautiful blonde showgirl named Lily. 
One evening in January 1931, Schultz and Lily were holding hands in a Manhattan nightclub. Suddenly an enraged and drunken Sherman appeared before their table and started shooting. He got Schultz in the shoulder before the bodyguards dropped him to the floor mortally wounded in a dozen places. Ignoring his henchman's pleas to get out of the place before the police arrived, Schultz, who had slid under the table in fear a moment before, broke off the top of a beer bottle. Sherman was unconscious and dying, but the vindictive Dutchman would not leave until he had slashed the flesh on his face into ribbons with the jagged bottle. No arrest was made for the Sherman killing. Schultz was soon recovered from his wound. Now he had only one rival, Vincent Cole, a much tougher proposition than Sherman. Cole has been called the most cold-blooded killer in the history of American crime. In the next six months, he disposed of 14 of the Dutchman's followers sent to get him. Schultz retaliated by killing Cole's young brother. He got two of the Dutchman's truck drivers and one of his gunmen on the same night. On another occasion, he bombed Schultz's garage a few minutes before he left. Towards the end of the year, he nearly trapped Schultz in one of his own speakeasies. Knowing he would not sleep peacefully again until the coal threat was removed, Dutch Schultz sent an urgent call to Chicago for a couple of proven killers. They arrived, collected their fee, and on December 10th, 1931, carried out the job. A lone wolf, Coal was in a telephone booth in a cafeteria and sandwich shop when the killer's car drew up outside. One man stayed at the wheel... The other, cradling a tommy gun on his arm, strolled into the shop. Busy with his conversation, Cole was oblivious of the drama going on outside. Sweeping his gun over the customers and the proprietor, the killer warned, keep back and stay quiet and you won't get hurt. He then emptied his drum of ugly, short-snouted slugs into the phone booth and the figure outlined there. Cole sagged into a lifeless heap. The Dutchman's executioner calmly returned to his car and drove away. Although he was now overlord of the liquor racket in New York, Dutch Schultz decided that its future as a money-making business was limited. He knew it it was only a matter of time before prohibition was repealed, so started to look around for another illegal but profitable avenue for his talents. He tried drug-running, but found that efficient federal agents made it a precarious and unhealthy existence. Slot machines sounded promising, but his canny business instinct told him, on investigation, that the profits would be unduly affected every time a costly machine was captured and destroyed by the authorities. In a quandary, Dutch Schultz's attention was drawn to the numbers racket, a form of illegal lottery that had been flourishing in Harlem for many years. He approached a West Indian named Caspar Holstein, who controlled it and talked himself into a partnership in return for expanding and spreading the lottery through the whole of the eastern states. Within a few months, he had completely reorganised the business. Holstein was compulsorily retired with a guaranteed weekly income of $15,000. Schultz got everything he cleared over that. Just how much that was can be estimated from the fact that in one period of 307 days in 1934, the gross income of the racket was more than $20 million. For years the police and federal authorities had been out to get Dutch Schultz, but he had always been too crafty. Then the Al Capone case demonstrated a charge of income tax evasion was the best weapon with which to fight the big-time criminals. Investigators were set to work upon the Dutchman, but it was a long time before they succeeded in building a case against him. Even then they were not able to make it stick. In January 1935, a warrant was issued for his arrest. Following the advice of his squad of expensive lawyers, Schultz surrendered. Then, by devious legal means, they succeeded in having the case tried in a small county court in upstate New York. Out on bail, Schultz moved into the town and ingratiated himself with the population by gifts, lavish parties and hospitality. At the trial a few weeks later, the local jury acquitted him. The judge castigated them for extreme dereliction of duty but had no alternative but to discharge him. Schultz returned to New York a free man, apparently immune from the law and free to enjoy the $8 million of illegal booty he had salted away. But his business instincts would not let him retire. 
The liquor racket was, of course, finished, but the police were slowly but surely breaking up the numbers lottery, so he turned to what was known as the loan shark racket. Two brothers virtually controlled the business in New York. They were Joe and Louis Amberg. Their little unobtrusive Shylock officers covered the city, battening on the sick workers behind with the rent housewives who had been gambling on the races, and anyone else who wanted a small loan to tide them over a difficulty. The smaller the loan, the higher was the interest, calculated at a weekly rate which reached astronomical proportions in the course of a year. To enforce payment, the Ambergs employed a team of thugs who rarely allowed a bad debt to spoil the appearance of the books. Dutch Schultz started by sending two of his boys, Frank Dolak and Ben Holinsky, into Brooklyn, the heart of the Ambergs' empire, to open up a competing office on working-class Pitkin Avenue. Within two hours they were back. Joe Amberg had appeared at the new office with a dozen henchmen who proceeded to wreck the place. Dutch Schultz's reply was a peremptory order to his two gunmen to return to Pitkin Avenue and open the joint with music and flags. Two days later, on September 17, 1935, the bodies of Dolak and Holinsky, riddled with bullets, were dumped from a speeding car outside Schultz's headquarters in the Bronx. The Ambergs had opened the war and got in the first kill. The Dutchman set to work to prove that what the papers said about him being New York's underworld czar were not a figment of the reporter's imagination. He again sent for the Chicago killers who had rid him of the mad dog Cole. They cornered Joe Amberg in his garage as he was entering his great bulletproof limousine on the way to an afternoon's golf. With his chauffeur, he was lined up against the wall in a replica of the famous St. Valentine's Day massacre in Chicago. Their bodies were then methodically filled with Tommy gun bullets. Now everyone knew it would be a war to the finish. Pretty Louis Amberg vowed revenge for Joe's death. Dutch Schultz decided that while he was about it, he might as well put paid to both the Ambergs by killing Louis too. It was a happy ending for the city of New York and its millions of law-abiding citizens, on whom Dutch Schultz and his kind had battened for years, when both criminals succeeded in accomplishing what they set out to do.